<coughs> after the slideshow, we'll turn down the lights and turn up the stars and take a look at the night sky. If you have questions during the show, uh, just kind of call them out to me. I'll do my best to answer any questions you might have. <coughs> so, let's talk about Apophis. Has any of you heard of this uh, asteroid that people, some people say are going to strike the Earth in 2036? There's a lot being written out on the internet about this big rock. So, we're going to talk a little bit about it today and hopefully waylay any fears you might have. During the formation of the solar system, about four and a half billion years ago, some small bodies never grew big enough to become planets. We call them planetoids or asteroids. Most of them lie in a belt, oops, most of them lie in a belt between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. There's millions of asteroids. The largest is a big ball called Sirius, or excuse me, Ceres, which is about the size of Texas. Ceres is now considered to be a dwarf planet. It's so big and it's round. <clears throat> All of that orange area there is filled with rock. Filled with asteroids. If you fall them all together, they equal about 4% the mass of our moon. There's a lot of them there. They're just not, a, they're not really big. The average distance between asteroids is about half a million miles. Some of these uh, rock, you know, I'm sorry, I'm moving the board. The Girl Scouts must have asked too many questions. <laughs> Some of these sometimes stray, stray away from the main belt and actually cross the orbital path of the Earth. One of these was discovered in 2004 at the Kip Peak National Observatory by the 90-inch Bach telescope. It was named after Apep, which is the uncreator in uh, Egyptian mythology, the uh, god of chaos and darkness. It's a serpent that dwells in the, in the darkness of the Earth's middle, tries to swallow the sun at night. This asteroid is about as tall as Cleveland's Kermit Tower. And you can see there, it's, it's not really round. It looks like kind of an odd-shaped container. Mm -hmm. It's really weird looking. Most of them, uh, asteroids are oblong or odd-shaped. They're not round. They're just big chunks of rock. After the uh, confirmation of discovery of Apophis, uh, NASA determined that it would pass the Earth on <coughs> April the 13th, 2029. Uh, Friday the 13th, as a matter of fact. <laughs> uh, just a quick reminder, make sure you're so. So NASA determined that if this asteroid was of 510 megatons of TNT, the impact that hit the uh, Barringer Crater in Arizona was about three megatons. The eruption of Krakatoa in Indonesia back in 1883 was about 200 megatons. And the largest hydrogen bomb ever exploded was about 50 megatons. The chicks of the impact in the Yucatan Peninsula that believed to be a significant factor in the uh, extinction of dinosaurs, uh, it's estimated to be about 100 million megatons. That was quite a bit. A 
Apophis is at level one on the Torino impact scale. This was developed as a hazard impact in June of 1999. So it is a hazard, but it's it, as a, a one, it means it's not going to hit the Earth. Apophis will miss the Earth in 2029. We know this. But it will return for another close encounter in 2036. So a possible impact, there's its orbit, a possible impact is dependent on this rock passing through an area called a gravitational keyhole in 2029. <clears throat> it's a precise region of space, no more than a half mile wide that would set up a, a future impact in 2036. The uh, effect of the <coughs> impact was very based on the asteroid's location. <coughs> it would damage thousands of square miles of the Earth's surface, but it's unlikely to have any long-lasting global effects. This uh, this shows the probability of Apophis striking Earth over the next 88 years. The greatest probability is in the year 2036, and the odds of an impact is considered to be about 1 in 250,000. Not very great. Scientists will continue to measure Apophis orbit and refine predictions for 2029 and 2036. And if predictions continue to determine that the Earth indeed becomes threatened by this huge rock, then what? What should we do? <clears throat> well, it's been suggested that we send an astronaut to the asteroid. Uh, Bruce would do the job. <laughs> yeah, we could wrap it in foil. The foil and let the uh, sun's pressure and light rays uh, move the rock into a slightly different orbit. So that might work, take an awful lot of moon foil. <clears throat> and I wouldn't volunteer for the mission. More realistic is uh, the European Space Agency's proposed Don Quixote mission. It's intended to test whether a spacecraft could deflect a collision. It's scheduled for <coughs> launch in either 2013 or 2015. It's actually a dual mission, two, two spacecraft. The first one called Sancho will arrive and orbit the asteroid and study it. Now, this is not a prophet that they're going to. This is another asteroid, another one that is not in any danger of hitting the Earth. And then the second uh, spacecraft will impact the asteroid at about 10 kilometers per second. So Sancho will then move in closer and send a little probe down uh, a sensor and measure exactly what happened how the asteroids uh, is uh, made up and what effect the impactor had on it. We really have a significant amount of time to gather more information from the Don Quixote mission. And we have to see if Apophis does indeed pass through this keyhole area in 2029. If it appears then that the asteroid's still a threat, <clears throat> Many possibilities remain to assure the safety of the Earth. So despite what may be promoted on the internet or in the media, it appears that we actually have little to fear from this space rock. <clears throat> NASA researchers have recently lowered their estimate of the number of medium-sized asteroids uh, by about 44 percent. The old model showed about 35,000 asteroids in the size between 
101,000 readers. And that's now been reduced down to about somewhere between 19,000 and 21,000. But we've only actually found 5,200 of these asteroids. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. So if you want to see Apophis, here's where you can look. On April the 1st, April Fool's Day, of course, you can track it from about 10 o'clock at night until midnight. It'll move from the constellation Taurus through Orion and Gemini and into Cancer. Of course, you'll need a telescope at least 18 inches in diameter uh, to see it. It's pretty small and pretty far away. So that's <coughs> the story of Apophis, the asteroid that many people are scared of. Okay. <coughs> Once again, I apologize for my voice. I know it's cracking up. So am I. <laughs> Okay, let's take a look at the night sky. Before, uh, before it gets dark in here, take a moment and notice the cargo points around the rim of the dome. North is over here by the door. South is down here. East and west. Sun, the moon, the stars all rise in the east and set over there in the west. So, if you were to come back here tonight to the monument about 11, 11.30, this might be what you would see in the night sky. You'd be able to pick out most of the bright stars, but the majority of stars, the true beauty of the nighttime sky, is washed out by all the urban lighting. Street lights, small lights, porch lights. We have to travel away from the cities and travel great distances in order to see a truly dark nighttime sky. A sky that just a few generations ago Maybe our great grandparents took for granted night after night. We now don't have much of an opportunity to see that. <clears throat> we are all descendants of star watchers. Every civilization in recorded history studied the motions of the stars. In fact, it was very important to them. They depended on the motions of the stars. They use the rising and setting of certain stars to determine when to plant their crops, when to harvest, when their feasts and festivals should start. It was very important that they understood the motions of the stars. And they knew what stars were in the sky. And to help them keep track of the multitude of stars that they saw under these really dark sky conditions, they broke these stars up into little groups. And they would connect the dots, so to speak, and imagine all types of creatures in the nighttime sky. And they put their gods and their heroes up in the night sky. And a lot of this was handed down to us over the years, mostly from the ancient Greeks and Romans. And today we recognize 88 official constellations in the nighttime sky. <coughs> Every star that you see is in one of these 88 constellations. Besides the constellations, there's little star groups that we call asterisms. Asterisms are patterns in the sky that are not constellations, but they're familiar to us. So one of the most common, well-known asterisms would be the Big Dipper. We all heard of the Big Dipper, right? Sure. Everybody see the Big Dipper? In 
in early spring, and it is almost spring, guys. A couple more days, spring will be here, even though it's felt like spring all week. It's been great. The Big Dipper is over here in the northeast. <clears throat> it's pretty easy to spot. It's seven stars are very bright. Four stars here in the bowl. Three stars here in the handle. Kind of looks like it's standing on its handle. The handle points down to the northeastern horizon. There's the Big Dipper. Pretty easy to spot. Big Dipper is in the constellation Ursa Major, or the Great Bear. And it's <clears throat> interesting to note that throughout recorded history, many civilizations saw a bear up here in the sky. So let's see how well your imagination is. Let's see if you can see a bear up here in the sky. You see a horse? OK. Well, let's imagine that this bowl of the dipper here in this area in front is the bear's body. Here's his head right here. Maybe this is his nose. Here's a leg and a paw, front paw. Here's a rear leg and a paw. Another paw down here. And what's really strange about this bear, it's got a long tail. Whoever saw a bear with a long tail. So, who can see a bear? A few of you. How about now? Ursa Major, the great bear, one of the largest constellations in our night sky. It covers a big area of sky. If we come back here to the dipper, we can use these bright stars to find other interesting star groups and constellations. Come back here to the bowl and draw an imaginary line between the two end stars in the bowl of the dipper. Extend that line northward about five times its length. It points right to this moderately bright star right here. Anybody know what that star is? North Star. North Star, okay, you're all good. You know your stars here in this group. This is the North Star of Polaris. Polaris is the end star in the handle of the Little Dipper. Little Dipper is a little more difficult to spot. Too bad, 
Anyway, if we come back here to the dipper and use your imagination, let's fill the dipper's bowl with water. Fill it up with water. And then we're going to come here to the bottom of the dipper and poke a hole in the bowl. So the water dribbles out. The water's going to come out of the hole in the bottom and dribble down, dribble, 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 and fall right on the back of Leo the lion. This is Leo right here. And it kind of looks like a lion. There's this little asterism here. It's the lion's head. It looks like kind of a backwards question mark. This is his mane. He's, the lion is looking this direction. This is his front legs. Here's his body right here and his hind quarter right here. I like to picture him as a reclining on the grass. Some people picture him as he's running along. There he is. Leo the lion. If you've been outside the last few nights, you may have noticed over in this part of the sky an extremely orange colored star. Yes, it's Mars. The planet Mars is over here just below Leo. And it's very, very red. Now, really, here in the planetarium, I, I don't like the light bulb that they put in for Mars. It's, it's too red. It, it looks like a cherry. Uh, Mars is, is reddish color. To me, it looks like a pumpkin. Yeah. And it's very bright. And it's very high and very nice and very pretty. You can't mistake it. You, 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 uh, look up in that area of the sky, and it really does look great. That is the planet Mars. There's two other planets in our early evening sky. They're set by, they set before 11 o'clock. <coughs> like I said, this sky is set up for about 11 o'clock. Jupiter and Venus. Very good. They're over here in the west, right after the sun goes down. Venus is extremely bright, getting brighter, getting higher. Jupiter is a little less bright, and it's getting lower. Jupiter was higher in the sky, and in the last week, they've passed each other. Jupiter has fallen down towards the west. Venus has risen higher and higher. And they've actually switched positions. Jupiter is headed for the horizon. It won't be around more than another few weeks. And Venus is going to hang around until June the 5th, when Venus is actually going to transit the sun. It's going to pass directly in front of the sun. A very rare occurrence. Uh, this is going to take place on June the 5th. In fact, we're going to have a program here at the monument on that day. We have telescopes set up specially equipped filtered telescopes to view the sun up on the Monument Plaza on June the 5th. This, this just doesn't happen very often. Okay, so those are the two bright objects in the evening sky in the west. But uh, by this time of night you might notice that there's just a plethora of extremely bright stars over in the western part of the sky. These are the bright stars of winter. They're headed towards the western horizon. They won't be with us much longer. And there's just a, a whole bunch of really bright stars here in, in this area of the sky. More bright stars than anywhere else. And down here in the southwest is a constellation that many people are familiar with. And that's Orion the Hunter right here. <clears throat> Orion is very easy to spot. Four bright stars in a big rectangle with three equally spaced stars kind of in a diagonal line right in the middle. The two bottom stars are the Hunter's knees. This is Rigel and Safe. These two stars are his shoulders. This star is called Bellatrix. And this star here, if you look at it, it's got kind of an orangish color to it. 
also. It's a red super giant star, and its name is Beetlejuice. <laughs> Isn't that a great name for a star? Beetlejuice. So those are his shoulders. And here in the middle, these three stars are called Orion's Belt. What is it called the Belt Star? Hanging down from his belt is a little line of stars that's his sword. <coughs> from Beetlejuice, he's holding a club in this hand. He's going to put the stars in. And over here, he's holding a shield. This little arc of stars right here is his shield. Right up above his shoulders, this little patch of very faint stars. That's Orion's head. I always knew that he wasn't very smart with his small head. But uh, that's Orion the hunter. There he is. Three hunters. It looks like an umbrella. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Orion is accompanied by a pair of hunting dogs. Canis Major, the large dog. Canis Minor, the small dog. Every hunter needs a, pair, needs a couple dogs to help him hunt. Canis Minor is down here in the southwest, kind of low. There's a very bright star right here. This star is called Sirius. Sirius is sometimes called the dog star. And here in the planetarium, because this is so bright, it kind of looks like a donut. But Sirius is not a donut. It's just a really bright star. That's just an effect of our planetarium projector. Uh, Sirius is fairly close to Earth. It's nine light years away. It takes like nine years to reach us from Sirius. It's the closest star that you can see in the night sky tonight. So imagine, let's, let's see if you can see a dog here. Imagine Sirius is the dog's nose. This is his head. Or maybe these are his ears. This is his front legs coming down like that, his body, and his rear legs right here. Looks like he's jumping up that direction. Doesn't that look like a dog? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think so too. I don't have a picture of a dog, but kind of looks like a dog. Genus Major, the big dog. <coughs> yes. That's the large hunting dog. Now Ryan has a second dog, a small dog, we got to come up here to this next bright star. This star is called Procyon. <clears throat> the, the small hunting dog, Canis Minor, is this star and this star. So who can see a dog there? No, me neither. Our ancestors must have had a lot of imagination. Maybe they thought it was a wiener dog. Those two, those two stars uh, make up Canis Minor, the small dog. Above the small dogs, another constellation that many people are familiar with, and that is Gemini, the twins, the twin boys from Greek mythology, Pollux and Castor were their names. This star is named Pollux, this star is named Castor. And you can kind of maybe imagine two stick figures side by side, one coming down here. There's his feet, there's his arms. Another one coming down here, there's his feet. His arms come across there. <clears throat> the twin boys, Pollux and Castor. Gemini the twins. There they are. <laughs> so, those are the major star groups that we're going to find. There's one more planet that I'm going to point out to you over here in the east, really low, just rising right around 1030, is Saturn. Yes. Very good. 
Saturn is just rising, and Saturn is going to climb higher and higher in the night sky, and it's going to be with us all summer uh, in our evening sky. Saturn is a spectacular sight in a small telescope. If you get an opportunity this summer, this spring and summer, to get out somewhere and see Saturn in a telescope, I'd encourage you to do it. It's, it's really a, a beautiful sight. Much more interesting than looking at Mars. Although Mars is interesting too, but it, Mars just kind of looks like an orangish colored dot. There's not many features. Saturn, you can see, you can definitely see the rings, you can see patterns. It's really, really beautiful. Okay. That's my sky tour for this evening, or this afternoon, I'm sorry. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them. Excuse me again. Show all the pictures at the same time. Yeah. All right. Versa Major. Versa Minor. Draco the Dragon. Leo the Lion. Orion the Hunter. I think that's about it. Oh, Gemini the Twins. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Like Leo the Lion is staring at it. That's called the Beehive Cluster. 